So hello everybody and uh, welcome to the very last session of the 2021 Global Animal Disaster uh, Management Conference. We're very pleased to, this afternoon or today, this morning, whenever you're here, to have um, Jennifer Garner, Gardner and Nicole Marin from I4 presenting on evacuation planning guidelines for wildlife groups and carers. We're very pleased to have Jennifer and Nicole with us. And if you're interested in their presentation and their bios, you can find those on our website. I just want to start with a few housekeeping um, points. You're probably all aware by now, but the chat is um, disabled in Zoom. So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section and we'll uh, get to those at the end of the presentation. We'd also like to encourage you to, just for one more last time, um, use the hashtag GAD, G -A -D -M, conf in Twitter and any social media. And at the end, there's gonna be an evaluation for you to complete before you leave. Uh, and just as a reminder, we, will be rec we are recording this session and we will be editing the videos and making them available in July when we have our GADMAC award ceremony. And at the end of this presentation, um, I'll be doing some final um, closing remarks and a farewell to everyone. So without further delay, I'd now like to introduce um, Jennifer and Nicole from I4 to uh, present to us. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mel. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today on this last session of the Global Animal Disaster Management Conference. Uh, today, we will be sharing an overview of our newly piloted emergency evacuation workshop for wildlife groups and carers in Australia. The workshop is a guided two hour session. So today we will provide insight on the importance of this workshop and then go through the planning steps so that you'll have an understanding of the process and the outputs. So first, uh, quickly, we'll just introduce our team. I'm Jennifer Gardner, the manager for the Disaster Response and Risk Reduction Program at the International Fund for Animal Welfare, and I'm based in the United States. I'll be co-presenting with my colleague, Nicole Marin, IFAL's Animal Rescue Program Officer for our work in Australia. So for my work at IFAL, I split my time between responding to disasters around the world and then also working with disaster prone communities to support risk reduction activities like developing plans for managing animals before, during and after disasters. Historically, most of my work has been geared towards communities who experience um, disasters and face challenges with pets and livestock. And Nicole primarily works on wildlife rescue initiatives, including disaster preparedness and response and overseeing wildlife rescue projects in Australia. So in the end of 2019 and into 2020, we witnessed a disaster on a whole different scale the Australia bushfires. As many of you saw the news or <clears throat> experienced yourselves, these fires affected multiple states and lasted for weeks before fire crews were able to control the burning. 34 people lost their lives, 3,500 homes were destroyed, tens of thousands of livestock died, and the total land area destroyed was the equivalent to the size of the entire country of Syria. But then the news came out with the most staggering figure. Three billion wild animals were killed or displaced. Three billion animals is really hard to wrap your mind around. We knew that this disaster would bring challenges that we had never seen before. In this disaster, the needs were highlighted to a very specific group, wildlife carers. This is the term that's used in Australia for wildlife rehabilitators. These dedicated teams and individuals were working around the clock, caring for their animals undergoing rehabilitation, taking in new and injured uh, animals, performing field rescue of animals in needs. So we focused our efforts on reaching out to these organizations and carers to assess their immediate needs like feeding supplies or financial support, or even extra hands to allow them to take a much deserved break. And one of the qualities that really stood out was the consideration that they had for one another. Uh, we would hear people say something like, oh, you know, I'm okay for right now, but please check in with care so-and-so. Uh, they took in a lot of animals and they may need that extra supplies more than I do. 
And I learned uh, soon that this also came from a place of independence. Many carers were used to being self-sufficient, even during disasters. So our team worked to help out as many carers and groups as we could to get them through this overwhelming time. Once these immediate, the immediate emergency was over, we began to explore the areas of risk reduction to learn what these care networks needed long term. Everyone was talking about climate change and the intensity of this event and, you know, wondering, was this the new normal for Australia? So we knew we wanted to focus on preparedness so that wildlife cares would be ready for any potential weather uh, extreme weather in the future. We found that many carers uh, feared having to evacuate, and this was mainly because they didn't have a plan for where their animals would go. So Nicole and I set out to create a series of tools uh, specifically designed for the Australian wildlife carers. We knew these tools had to be user-friendly and something they could accomplish easily and see the benefit. And then hopefully they would feel a sense of relief once they were complete. So we decided to start with evacuation planning as our first tool. So before we jump into evacuation planning, I um, wanted to say that it's extremely important to our team to express that we believe that every animal facility should have a comprehensive crisis management plan. When you work with animals, you can expect that at some point, something will go wrong. And we believe you should have a plan in place to address it. A crisis management plan will explore all the possible risks your facility could face, like natural disasters, animal escapes, disease outbreaks, injuries to personnel, and, and so on. And by looking at how these emergencies could affect your operations, you can start to develop sets of protocols um, and, and work to ensure that you have the resources to carry out these plans. So I've included here a photo of beautiful vegetable stew. And we know, all know how stews um, have several key ingredients like tomatoes and onions and garlic. But then it's kind of up to you um, on your taste to decide how, what else it needs. So a crisis management plan is kind of the same. It has the key ingredients of an emergency planning and uh, defining roles and responsibilities. And then there are some customizable features like crisis communication that you might add if it's important to your organization. These plans are totally scalable to your needs. You may not need a lengthy plan if you're an individual carer and generally only have a couple of animals. And then the last uh, bullet point, ethical obligation, um, is a concept that I, I think really deserves some thought. When we take an animal into our care, do you think that we have an ethical obligation to ensure their health and safety if a disaster strikes? I think this is something we need to consider, and I believe a crisis management plan would ensure we meet our commitment to that animal. So while all of this is important, we are just going to focus on the evacuation planning for this workshop. So why do we plan for an evacuation? Well, there are some emergencies where we're going to be able to continue to provide care for animals in place, but there could come a time when the best decision will be to evacuate. Evacuations aren't easy, especially when we're working with wildlife. We have to make a plan in advance for a successful evacuation. When emergencies happen, it's easy to panic. If you don't have a plan, you might get overwhelmed thinking, you know, I have to pack up the animals and what supplies do they need and where are they going to go? And then if you have to transport them to other carers, you know, how will you ensure that they continue to get the right food and the proper medicine? A plan will eliminate this worry. Your team will know exactly who needs to do what to safely remove the animals and to also ensure that your staff and volunteers are also safely evacuated. Another benefit of planning for an evacuation is because it will build your organization's reputation as one that puts the well-being of your staff, your volunteers, and the animals as a top priority. We always want to set a good example 
And by having an evacuation plan, it demonstrates to the community that we are prepared for worst case scenario. No one wants to evacuate, but if you need to, you'll be ready. And lastly, if you do not have a plan, you could become a victim, meaning that you might have to be rescued by emergency services. And then that means you can't continue to save lives uh, if you are a victim, which really defeats the missions that we have as animal rescue organizations. And then this slide is sort of a why plan for evacuations part two. We often think that disasters won't affect us or that they won't be so extreme that we would ever need to evacuate. And this is usually a reason why we don't set aside time to make plans. So I wanted to share an example with you. Um, just last week here in the United States, we faced a historical winter storm. It affected multiple states, but Texas in particular was hit the worst. Texas is not known for cold weather. They generally have hot summers and mild winters. And the, the state had extremely cold temperatures, the coldest on record in 30 years. This winter storm caused power outages and water issues. And this was really devastating for the communities as they had no sources of heat in some cases. So then soon on the news, we began hearing stories about animal facilities, particularly zoos and sanctuaries that had populations um, that, of animals that weren't acclimated to cold weather, like tropical birds or primates. And so in this photo, the San Antonio Zoo got creative and they ended up moving some of their animal populations out of their enclosures and into other buildings like a vacant restaurant. Another sanctuary had to make urgent pleas to the community to get generators and propane heaters after losing some of their animals to the storm and struggling to evacuate. Both organizations made statements that they had not prepared for such an event. It really made me think about this presentation and how important it is for animal facilities to develop these crisis management plans and evacuation plans. It's better to have a plan and not need it than to need it and not have it. So now that we've covered the background on why we developed the evacuation planning workshop, I'm going to pass it over to Nicole, who is going to walk us through the process. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, so just a quick overview, this um, workshop is a two hour, five step disaster evacuation planning course. And the objective is to help um, wildlife groups develop an evacuation plan draft by the end of the workshop. Um, we also provide resources such as checklists and uh, ID card templates that they can use um, during a crisis event. So the way uh, it works is that we share with the attendees an evacuation plan template prior to the workshop that they then will fill during the breakout sessions that we provide. So on the first step of the workshop, we talk about forming a team and establishing a support network. So forming an emergency um, response team, typically with members of the institution, is key and extremely important as this group of people are the ones responsible for the creation, not only of the crisis management plan that, Je that Jen was talking about, but also uh, for the development of um, the evacuation plan. We also talk on this step of, on, of about how this team needs to identify and reach out to key stakeholders and local emergency authorities um, that will be able to assist and help during an evacuation and an emergency event. And this is just with the objective of developing a cooperative relationship with them. Um, these stakeholders could include uh, your local fire police authorities, animal control agencies, um, wildlife officials, local and regional um, animal welfare organizations, um, other wildlife care groups and veterinary practices as well. Thank you. So on step two, we talk about what um, they need and what they already have to evacuate. So we ask them to list 
the equipment, uh, supplies and resources they already have and what they need to acquire to safely evacuate these animals. So this list um, includes transport vehicles, uh, carriers, cages, bags, as well as medical supplies such as um, medication for sedation and also animal handling equipment. Um, we also ask them to calculate their needs based on the average number of animals in care and then check the availability of key resources required to identify what they need to then purchase or, or ask for. So part of um, step two also is to um, work on including on the evacuation plan a list of potential temporary placement facilities and cares. Um, this will be the people with the capacity and also skills to take care of um, the animals during an event and we ask the attendees to think strategically and consider whether if they are located nearby and Will, will also be impacted by the same emergency like a bushfire. So having a couple of options uh, in different geographic areas is ideal. On step three, we talk and work on key animal management recommendations. Um, so firstly, we suggest adding to the plan a list of um, the animals in care that includes their basic health information. So this list um, should be updated and cross-referenced with uh, their database regularly. And especially at the start and um, of, for example, bushfire seasons or flood seasons, when uh, the chances of an emergency um, event are higher. Um, secondly, we talk about how um, the use of identification tags and photographs or microchips um, is important, mainly to avoid the animals getting lost uh, during an evacuation. Um, we also suggest um, preparing evacuation kits with care instructions uh, for the temporary carers with clear instructions on how to look after uh, the animals that need um, special care. Now, um, in this, on this step, we also talk about how important it is to train staff members on the use of equipment, on handling animals, preparing, packing, transporting them to increase the likelihood of, an, of a safe, efficient and effective evacuation. Um, we actually advise them to conduct exercises and drills to practice these procedures and to have an estimated time of preparation and packing. Uh, this is just so um, the team or the person um, can anticipate a time frame and a workforce required to safely evacuate um, their animals. So part of um, step two um, is to um, work on a list of potential um, placement facilities. Sorry, um, sorry. So part of um, step three is um, uh, we talk about animal categorization. Now we have interviewed colleagues in the industry, and one of the key lessons and recommendations um, to prepare for and manage an organized and successful evacuation, even during an emergency and often under a lot of stress, is to strategically categorize the animals, and including this uh, in the evacuation plan. So how does this work? Um, these categories can be based on welfare grounds, but we also understand there are other factors to consider such as um, the conservation status of some of these species. Um, so for example, if you want to base the categories mainly on welfare grounds, one category can include um, the animals that are less likely to stress if we relocate them and are easy to pack and transport. Um, the second category could include um, animals that are, again are less likely to feel stressed if we relocate them but are not as easy to pack and transport so um, it requires a bigger effort. Um, and on the third category we can include uh, animals likely to feel stressed if we relocate them and easy to pack and transport. So just um, we came up with an example 
of how a facility that cares for and rehabilitates koalas can categorize their animals. So just for example purposes, um, we divided the animals in two categories. Um, as you can see here, um, category one includes koalas less likely to experience stress by relocation, so during transport and while being care in another facility. So this will um, include joeys and long-term residents that are more used to humans handling them. And in category two, um, we include animals that are more likely to spread to experience stress by relocation. Uh, so in this category, we will place animals, um, koalas in critical care or koalas that have been recently admitted and, not a, and are not as used to um, humans coming in and out of their enclosure or handling them. So how does this come handy? Um, so in the case of a bushfire, authorities usually notify people of the risk of a bushfire moving towards the area. And if there is a chance that they will need to evacuate, you will need to evacuate, they will let you know. So with this strategy, you can effectively coordinate the relocation of the, of the animals in category one, and then, uh, which are the ones that are less likely to experience stress, and then only worry about the animals in category two if the fire does, co does come close and the need for evacuation is imminent. Um, now, how people categorize their animals is completely up to them. Um, this is just an example, and we just realized that categorizing the animals is, um, can facilitate an evacuation and potentially save lives. Um, on step four, we asked them to add an updated um, site layout to the plan. This is important because a site layout will identify key areas um, during an evacuation and an emergency, such as evacuation routes, transport pickup sites, supply storage, and most important, the emergency assembly area within the property. So we actually advise them um, to consult with local authorities, such as fire authorities, to determine uh, the best evacuation routes, and also adding a copy of this site layout map highlighting evacuation routes to the evacuation plan, as well as placing multiple copies um, in visible locations throughout the building. Now, uh, in our fifth and last step of the workshop, we look into developing and adding action statements to the plan. Um, so action statements are clear and specific procedures outlining actions to be taken at different stages of the emergency. Uh, they will guide the team and um, they will guide the team on what triggers and activates the plan. So basically they are the hows and whens of an emergency and they can be designed around um, the emergency alert national warning system. Um, now in the template that we provide, we include um, an example of a five-stage bushfire emergency action statement table that includes uh, triggers and actions which is quite good for, for, for the attendees. And those are the five steps of our workshop. Now, um, just as a quick peek and overview of our template, um, just to give you guys an idea of how it looks like. Um, so like I said before, we share this template with the participants before the workshop so they can fill it in during the breakout sessions of the course. And it is a 12 page Word document. And as you can see, we purposely designed it to be a simple and user friendly resource. It's just a Word document. Um, this template um, includes multiple table lists including um, a table for the team contacts, a table for emergency contacts, um, another one for equipment and supplies, and of course one of the action statements, just to name a few. And also it includes, at the end, it includes a last walkthrough checklist, which is a people, facility, and admin final checklist uh, that they can use at the final stages of an evacuation to make sure the final details have been taken care of. Um, like, for example, doors and windows being closed and locked, uh, the alarms being armed or disarmed, and um, backup systems being checked. Now, 
this is a template and it is a draft so people are free to adjust it and modify it to their needs and um, yeah it's an um, 12 page document and um, from the feedback that we have received um, it, it is very easy to use so we're very happy uh, with that and that's basically all from me. Um, those are our five steps of our workshop and this is the template that we share with all the attendees and um, yeah that, back to you Jen. Great thanks Nicole. Um, so after the workshop we encourage participants to go through the plan and fill in any gaps that were missed. The goal of the workshop really is to have them walk away with a draft plan, but we realize that they may need to fill in additional details after the workshop. Uh, so once they get that plan to a pretty good place, uh, we recommend holding a disaster simulation. And we know because we're working with wildlife that we don't want to cause any stress to the animals. So stuffed toys, are a great substitute when practicing capture and handling and transport um, as you run through your plan. And you know this can be a really fun activity and a way to wrap in your volunteers and socialize them to your new plan. And then after the simulation, the core team can regroup and debrief on what went well and make any changes necessary to um, have the plan better suit their needs. And this is a living document. So we do want uh, changes to be made. We want them to review it each year, um, update the animals and, and, and really build to this plan to make it their own. We also recommend uh, using this plan as an opportunity to meet with local authorities. We are always looking for ways um, to promote collaboration between animal rescue groups and the government um, and other authorities like your emergency services. So this would be a great time to share the plan with them, exchange contact details, and then hopefully they will wrap the rescue group into um, when, they, when there are emergencies or if they have related activities happening in the area, you know, they know that they can wrap in this group um, because they're interested in emergency planning. So our team after the workshop um, does remain available to review plans, uh, share resources, and provide guidance as requested. And so this brings us to the end of our presentation. And I wanted to mention again that this evacuation planning workshop is just one part um, of this uh, disaster toolkit project that Nicole and I are working on. We hope to soon develop a comprehensive global resource offering a set of online courses uh, with guidelines and templates um, for wildlife rescue groups uh, and carers so that uh, they can prepare and respond and recover from future disasters. We are also working on similar courses uh, that will be tailored to other countries and regions and look forward to sharing all of these with you. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, again, we really uh, appreciate being included in this conference and uh, look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Nicole. What a fantastic project. And uh, it's fabulous to see these sorts of things come to, you know, to, to something tangible that um, can actually really help people directly. Um, certainly, I've been involved in post bushfire interviews um, with, the, with our state fire service and spoken to carers who have multiple animals who basically just said, I couldn't leave them. And, and you know, it's just fortunate because obviously I'm talking to them, but they survived um, the experience. It's, um, you know, they won't leave. They just won't leave. And, and, and so having a plan is so essential. It also looks like something that could be, you know, reasonably easily modified to um, other sorts of um, situations for small enterprises like, you know, horse adjustment properties and things like that, where there might be mix of, of animals and somebody might find themselves responsible for a whole lot of other, other animals that they're not normally responsible for. So thank you so much. That's, that was really interesting. I know we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A, so please, um, I will get to those and I'll, um, I'll, I'll read those out. So please, if you've got more questions, please uh, type those in the Q&A. In the meantime, I've got a question here about um, your response during the Black, Saturday, uh, Black Summer sorry, um, fires. Um, 
And just asking about how your response was uh, coordinated. Uh, was there any coordination with sort of government or, or are you in any of the plans? We've had quite a lot of presentations about, about you know, integrating people into plans and how tricky it can be in this area. So um, I will let Nicole answer some of that because she has um, participated in quite a few of the after action um, planning groups. So Nicole, do you want to jump in on that? We have your mute, Nicole. Oh, can you, we can't hear you. Ah, you can't hear us maybe. You can't hear us. Looks like you're on mute, Nicole. I'm just gonna ask her to unmute. <laughs> no. Sounds like we I'm not sure why we've lost Nicole. Sorry, Nicole. Um keep keep trying and uh <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you back at some point and uh, Jennifer will have to, uh, to take the brunt of oh. now. Sorry, Jennifer. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I mean, I can, <laughs> I can say that we did um, liaise with uh, a lot of the work that we um, supported was in New South Wales. And so we did liaise with the um, kind of government authorities in that region and the groups that already uh, were working on that there. And so post um, fires, I was hoping Nicole might be able to share because I know that there have been a number of working groups um, and we have tried to jump into those to provide um, feedback on our experience during it and look for um, opportunities to really promote that collaboration between the authorities and the um, NGOs and wildlife care groups. We understand that there was a lot of frustration. Um, so we have been trying our best to help facilitate that. Yeah, certainly it was a tricky situation. Nicole, are you back online? You're not, you don't- Yes. Be... Ah, did you hear the question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I have no idea what happened there. Yes, I heard it, but I, I couldn't unmute, unmute myself, um, apologies. So just to, as a quick overview of what we did uh, last, during the last bushfire season, um, I for actually worked uh, quite closely with um, local partners uh, to rescue, rehabilitate and release uh, wildlife impacted by the fires. And um, we also provided support, uh, fuel cards, um, food, you name it, to wildlife carers across the country. Um, in, we also, like in the past, we also have provided them with um, enclosures, um, rescue vehicles, fire gear, and veterinary supplies. And uh, last year, uh, we actually deployed our USC um, IFO koala detection dog, Bear, uh, to help find surviving koalas. Um, which was amazing. He found, uh, and his team found more than a hundred koalas, and um, that's basically how we how we um, responded to the bushfire season. Um, we still have a lot to learn, and we try our best to stay in touch with all our partners and all the rescue, all the wildlife rescue care groups that we know of. Uh, and try to, su to provide support. Um, mental health is also a big thing for mm -hmm. us. So um, we've been doing some work with, um, with that as well. So yeah, I hope that answers your question, Amel. Yeah, no, fantastic. And the mental health uh, aspects have been, been spoken about before in the conference and um, yeah, something I've, I've got a lot of interest in. Um, okay, so we have quite a few questions now from the floor. So I hope you're happy to sort of stay on and, and, and do that. Um, so uh, we have a question here about when, when do you offer the training and how is it promoted amongst care groups nationally? And then as an extra, what's the cost? <laughs> um, so we first... Um, presented this workshop to um, our partners um, but I think we plan to promote it a little bit more maybe in social media again it was a pilot training we just received really 
positive feedback. So I think we're gonna be working. We're gonna be working the next couple of weeks and months on promoting it. Uh, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, we did it online. Uh, again, if one wildlife group uh, finds this helpful, we are more than happy. At the end of the day, we are trying to help those who are helping wildlife. So it wouldn't cost anything. Fantastic. Wow. Um, uh, I've got a question here. Um, I'm associated with the Wildlife Rescue Group in the Snowy Mountains of New South Wales. How do we arrange a training course for our local group? Oh, there we go. Yeah, so if you want, um, I can't see who, who sent that question, but if you want to send me an email to nmarin at i4.org, I'm happy to coordinate um, training with you guys. That's great. I know who that was, so I can uh, contact her as well. Excellent. Okay, uh, another one. How many workshops have you conducted? How many facilities now have plans? I think you may have kind of got to that in your last uh, question, responses. Am I, am I correct Hello? that you haven't, you haven't actually run any any um, workshops yet with with carers directly? No, only with partners. Yes. Um, well, but looking forward to um, working, doing it with other wildlife groups. Hmm. Um, I've got another another person here saying thank you for all you do. Can you repeat or post the template doc link? Yeah, so the reason why we didn't share a big screen of our template is because we want to we um, ideally that template will be uh, attached with the workshop. We, we don't want people just to fill it in. We want we want to help them and guide them on how to fill it, it fill it properly. Which is why during the workshop we have those breakout sessions to guide them and answer questions on how to do it properly. So um, we we usually share the template with people that are going to be part of the workshop. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so I have somebody here who's saying, how do you become a trainer for this course? Um, this particular person has an emergency management background uh, and animal rescue and is, uh, is asking about, are you looking for local trainers? Yeah, that would be a great idea. Again, shoot me an email. I'm happy to, to discuss this a little bit more for okay. sure. Um, another question here from Jody. Um, were animal specific or specified feed suppliers included in discussions and plans to ensure for supply and production of specific products which um, may exceed usual demands or ensure availability if their facilities are directly impacted? I don't think I read that very well. Yeah, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, sorry. Um, were animal specific or specialized feed suppliers included in discussions uh, to ensure for supply um, and production of specific products um, which, which may exceed the usual demands. Um, I guess it's just to do with the actual response to the fires. I'm not sure I understand Sorry, the question hundred yeah, percent, um, but uh, we, only, we only help people that ask for help. So we didn't just send food or, or, um, or money to these people. We first, um, monitor the situation, touch base with them. And if they needed a particular uh, so, something like food, we will uh, then send them um, either vouchers. It was up to them to, um, to acquire these products. Um, I, I actually don't understand the question per, like so 100%. Was, so if, you, if whoever sent the question wants to send me an email and I'm happy to answer it properly. Great, thank you. Sorry about that. I've got a question here from uh, one of our, our, our presenters actually from Japan and she's, uh, she's saying how can we prioritize wildlife species um, that, that we have to rescue? She says in Japan um, there are also wild animals such as monkeys, bears and wild boars that are locally considered harmful animals. Um, so she's wondering about prioritizing how, how we might go around prioritizing perhaps um, the more dangerous or predatory animals over some of the others, perhaps. That's a tricky one. I think that, um, I think it all comes down to, first of all, um, welfare. And, um, and to be honest, when you, when you, when you are rescuing animals, uh, it is important to have a clear triage system in place where all of these decisions are being made based on the animal, how, 
how um, bad the injuries are, uh, how much risk that animal opposes to whoever is, risk, is rescuing them or taking care of. So uh, at the end of the day, it's up to the rescuers uh, and the triage team to, mm. to, to assess the situation. Um, it, so many species out there that um, it's completely up to that team. Mm, absolutely. And I imagine uh, in relation to that question, probably people have different handling skills as well. So it's probably a combination. Exactly. Right exactly. A risk, I'm assuming there's a quick risk assessment being made in the moment. Yeah. Absolutely. I think I've got one last question here. I'm not entirely um, sure of the question. It, it, it says when people go back, um, do you encounter problems with uh, the sort of hygiene conditions? I'm not sure if that's um, going back, I assume, after the fires, bushfires, have there been problems with? Um, so, that could, yeah. yeah, I can, I can jump. I think I can on. try to sleuth that one maybe because it is something that I, um, I'm wondering about is what, one of the things we didn't talk about in, uh, too much in today's presentation, but as part of the, if, if you do evacuate, part of the um, plan is re-entry, right? Like at what point mm -hmm. do you um, know that it's safe to return? And then once you get that um, go ahead, that it's safe to go back to your facility, you're obviously going to want to do um, a very thorough check of the facility to um, account for any damage that happened. And then if that's what the sanit sanitary conditions are, you know, it would be going through and, and, and cleaning everything up before the animals get to come back. So if that's what they were asking, that's, um, that is part of the evacuation plan. We've had a bit of follow up there. I think it, uh, perhaps it was as much to do around sort of quarantining. Um, if animals have gone to another place, do you have to, to do quarantine? Um, you know, when you're bringing animals back from different places into one location again? Yes. Um, so one of the things that we mentioned during our workshop is um, the importance of creating um, documents and signing agreements with these uh, temporary placement facilities and in these documents you state uh, all of these procedures and I'm assuming there will be a separate room possibly or a separate enclosure just to avoid uh, that risk of, um, of just avoiding posing a risk to the, uh, to the residents, to the animal residents of that uh, facility. Um, Again, that's, that's, those are things that we discuss um, during the workshop because it's, the risk is not only for when you, your animals come back, but also for when you place your animals in another facility. And um, that all has to be agreed prior to any emergency event. And just keep in mind that when we talk about um, temporary placement facilities, uh, they, may, they may be part of your list, but you also may be part of their list. So there has to be a clear agreement with protocols, um, with agreed protocols on how to do things um, in a safely manner. Sure, thank you. Um, okay, I think that's the end of our, our Q&A session. So thank you so much for staying on and for answering the questions. We really appreciate that. We especially appreciate you, Jennifer. We know you're um, calling in from the United States and uh, it must be a horrendous time of day for you. So, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having us.